Hello, this is Chris Safarova. Welcome to another episode of the Strategy Skills Podcast. Our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, get the overall approach using well-managed strategy studies. It is a free download. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. It is F-I-R-M-S consulting.com forward slash overall approach. And if you're currently updating your resume, you can get McKinsey and BCG winning resume example. It is a resume that got offers from both firms. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash resume PDF. And today we are speaking with Elliot Parker. Elliot is the founder and CEO of High Alpha Innovation, a venture builder that partners with corporations, universities, entrepreneurs to co-create startups that solve compelling problems. Welcome, Elliot. So great to have you with us. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Elliot, so you have a very interesting journey that got you here. Maybe we could start there. Could you share with us your story that got you to what you're doing now? Sure. Yeah, happy to. So yeah, we're currently on the CEO, founder of a company called High Alpha Innovation. We build startups. And uh, we do that with corporations, universities, world-class founders, as you said. Um, I feel like it's the culmination of everything that I've learned along the way in my career over many years. Um, I've spent my career helping large organizations learn how to become more innovative, but also uh, consider myself first and foremost an entrepreneur. Uh, I began my career at a, 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 a large accounting firm uh, called Arthur Anderson, my first job out of college where I was on a small consulting team that was working to commercialize IP out of big companies and value IP and things like that. And uh, was there for the uh, the collapse of that firm uh, associated with the Enron scandal. It was amazing. Uh, this large, big company that I worked for uh, had a few uh, employees in, uh, in another state that did something that led to this 35,000 person company to go out of business within three weeks. It was an amazing lesson to me about uh, how to uh, consider risk in your career and uh, the riskiness of big companies compared to the riskiness and rewards of startups. Before we go on, go ahead. incredible career, and I'm looking forward to get to Clay Christensen and all that and, and yeah. your current work. Before we go on, can you take us back to those three weeks and what was it like? Well, so it was a, it was a public accounting firm and the firm was um, was indicted. Uh, which immediately meant that nobody wanted to work with uh, this 100 plus year old accounting firm anymore. And so revenue evaporated. I think at the time, I can't remember the exact revenue, but it was in the 35,000, something like that global employees. I, I want to say in the, somewhere in the 10 to $15 billion range in revenue. And immediately uh, customers uh, decided they, they couldn't work with the firm anymore for obvious reasons and started pulling out. And um a lot of uncertainty immediately. This is my first job out of school. I'm <laughs> learning how the world works. And uh, all of a sudden, we don't have any projects to do. And uh, there's a sense that uh, we may all be out of a job here soon. Um, there was hope that that wouldn't be the case, that the firm would continue. We liked the people we were working with. And soon we started having bits of the business being acquired. So you'd have a team over here that got purchased or acquired by a, another consulting firm. Uh, and announced that they were leaving en masse to go over to uh, another firm and kind of watching and waiting and seeing how it all played out. You have people applying to other jobs. At the time, fortunately, I was getting ready to go to business school. So I was watching it. Uh, our group got acquired by another firm where I spent a grand total of, uh, I think, a month under employment I, before I left to go to business school. So it was I was able to observe the whole thing with some degree of um, objectivity. And uh, and watch it. But the lesson for me, I remember driving in the uh, the car with my dad, who's a longtime entrepreneur, um, who told me uh, at the time, you know, uh, big companies are perceived as being less risky uh, from an employment standpoint. The reality is that uh, you don't control your fate, and that every large company can lay you off or go out of business at any time. Um, startups are perceived as very risky. The reality is that in startups, you can at least to a greater degree often control your fate. And determine the outcome, uh, and that wasn't a lesson. A lesson I've carried throughout my career. That is so true. Do you remember how senior partners were taking what was going on? How they were managing it? Yeah, um, uh, I'd say uh, some were were calm and um, 
in some ways saw it as an opportunity to go do something different. Uh, in other cases, absolute panic. On the other end of the spectrum, you had some, for example, some partners who had just retired and uh, you know had their all of their a good chunk of their their personal wealth tied up in the um, in the firm, and that was evaporating, and there was not anything they could do about it. So. Um, I think people were impacted differently. Um, in most cases, at least at my level, the junior level, I think um, nearly everyone that I can think of ended up better off uh, with a new job, but now uh, uh, a network that had been dispersed across corporate America uh, in good ways. So in the end, for me personally, it was a good lesson and a good um, kind of a, a dispersion of the network that was helpful, came to, came to prove helpful later. Do you feel that this could have, and I know it's a little bit difficult because at the time you were a junior and you did not have visibility, but do you think it is the kind of thing that could have happened to any of the big firms or? Oh yeah. Really and likely big... still will, likely still will, right? It's the the risk of um, um, a limited li liability partnership um, where any one partner in that partnership can do something bad uh, and the the partnership is held accountable for it. Um, I thought at the time we'd see a, a change in the organizational structure of some of these firms to protect against that. And the, as far as I can tell, there hasn't been. So I, I think it's a matter of time before it happens again. Um, uh, it's it's uh, the nature of that that legal structure. I think that legal structure for incorporation works great when you've got a dozen partners who you know well. Um, it's a little bit riskier when you've got thousands of partners spread around the world, any, any one of whom could decide to do something that uh, gets the firm in, uh, in hot water. Very true. And then also, regardless of the structure, the way clients reacted was also incredibly damaging and basically yeah. killed the firm. They had no choice. It, it was the way the incentives were set up, right? You, uh, if you're a publicly traded company, uh, your accounting firm needs to be upstanding for the output to be credible and believable, and you need it to be credible and believable and therefore require to switch in firms immediately. So I don't blame any of them. Of course. Do you feel anything now with your wealth of experience? Do you feel that, for example, if you were managing the firm at that time during those three weeks, do you think something could have been done to save it? It's a very good question. Um, ultimately, in that case, what happened was the, the firm was found not guilty, uh, but that took months or years to play out. And by then it was too late. It was gone. Um, it, it's an interesting question to think back and not, not one I've considered. Um, Maybe perhaps there would have been a way to accelerate the, the conclusion uh, that the firm had not actually done anything that the firm should not have been held liable, even if individuals of the firm could have been. Um, uh, that, that could have been one option. Uh, I think it was, a uh, from a, a prosecutorial standpoint at the time felt like a, um, an overstep and the wrong thing. And ultimately, I guess the firm was found not guilty. It, it was kind of a lot of collateral damage, uh, and economic inefficiency, uh, that was unnecessary, uh, in retrospect, but, you know, people are operating with limited information, trying to do their best. So it's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, the the people running the firm at the time were under a tremendous amount of pressure, and uh, it's probably that in ninety nine out of a hundred cases, the outcome would have been what it was. Yes, it was a very tough situation to be in. The changes needed yeah. to be before before this. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fundamentally comes back to the legal structure of incorporation, which is why I, I suspect we'll see it happen again. So after this, you're, laying, you're basically going to business school. What was your experience like there? So in, in business school, my goal was to learn, um, to connect with and engage with uh, and to learn about um, other entrepreneurs and their journeys. Uh, my goal was to, uh, to be an entrepreneur myself. Um, it's in my DNA going back generations. As far as I can go back to the 1600s and beyond, long chain of entrepreneurs. and so. Um, my goal at business school was to uh, use that experience to engage with others who uh, had, had decided to be entrepreneurs to learn more about their journey and see if I could do the same thing and had an amazing opportunity, took advantage of that. One of the, the amazing things about being in business school or in school period is that you can pick up the phone and call just about anyone, tell them you're a student and you'd like to learn more about their experience and there's a good chance you're going to get a, uh, 
uh, willingness to engage. Uh, the day you graduate, that stops. And so I was very aware of that in business school and used it to uh, to meet some amazing, famous, world-class entrepreneurs who I proactively reached out to to see if I could learn from their experience. And I did. Uh, the big lesson was that uh, here's what I learned at business school. None of the buildings were named after investment bankers or consultants. <laughs> they were all named after entrepreneurs. I just said it, it impressed upon me how much of an impact an entrepreneur can have on the world and how much change they can bring, how much good an entrepreneur can do uh, through solving problems, through uh, for-profit entrepreneurship. I also, the other thing, uh, these entrepreneurs who had made it and who'd done really well, uh, they were just regular people who uh, decided to push hard and work hard and take their chances and try to expand the surface area of luck in their lives. And I thought I could do that too. And then the other piece was just the connections that you make in business school. The network that I built was amazing. As far as the, the classwork, interesting, uh, but that wasn't the primary, not where most of the lessons came from. Elliot, for our listeners who are not as good as you in building relationships and having a strong network, what advice would you give? Because that is something that you excel at and you could leverage throughout your entire career. Yeah, yeah, be helpful. That's it. That's the that's the lesson. Be helpful. Uh, I mean, a lot a lot of people uh, make the mistake, especially er early in their career, of feeling compelled to um, to network. Uh, for me, that's an that's an excruciating proposition. I, the, the worst situation for me personally is to be at a, a cocktail party where I don't know anybody and I have to feel like I have to network. It's awful. It's awful. Uh, very unnatural. Uh, and so I find that the best way to build a, a strong network is to just be helpful. Uh, look for opportunities to help those around you. And uh, that builds relationships. And in in return, people find opportunities to help you. And Litton, how did you continue the relationship after, for example, business call? How do you find the time? How do you keep in touch? I am not as good at that as I wish I was. Uh, but I do look for opportunities to reach out and connect. And again, in the spirit of being helpful, uh, find ways to help those uh, make connections, between people I know who might benefit from knowing each other. I find something, some piece of information, introducing people to business opportunities, being helpful is the best way to keep a network going. And um, the network is a is a, a kind of the end result, not the not the goal. It's a it's a byproduct of of what you're doing to be helpful along the way, I think. So what would be an example of being helpful other than introducing people you know? Um it would be, for example, finding some interesting piece of information along the way. And in, in my work now, where we're building startups. We uh, we come across all kinds of opportunities. And often I, I have a chance to pass along, hey, I just heard this really interesting opportunity. I, I, I encountered a, a, a corporation that's got a need and your business solves it. Have the two of you met? Because I think they'd be a great customer for you, introducing people to business opportunities um, all the time. And in, in what we do, we I have opportunities to do that. And that's fun. That is a very good way to help. That is something that most people need help with. Yeah. So what happens after business school? So in, in business school, I, I uh, started a couple of companies while I was there and, and learned about uh, what it was like to build entrepreneurs or be an entrepreneur and, and start things. And the thrill of having a customer hand over money for something you've produced. <laughs> it is a rush and it's addictive. Um, and then immediately after business school, um, had an interesting opportunity pop up where I, I decided to, to set aside the opportunities I've been working on and go uh, take a job in corporate venture capital and in innovation, working at a firm called Roche Diagnostics, where um, I had a chance to uh, to help that organization think through external venture investments they were making and internal ventures that we could build inside the business as a way to help them be more innovative. Did that for a few years, learned a lot about how innovation works inside of big companies uh, and often how it doesn't work, what makes it hard. Um, left that, spent many years working as an entrepreneur and building building startups and um, all sorts of industries. Um, and then uh, and then had a chance um, uh, just over a decade ago to uh, to go work at uh, the consulting firm, strategy firm founded by Clayton Christensen called Innosite in Boston. and left everything aside that I've been working on. We, uh, the family and I, we moved to Boston and um, spent seven years working there and getting to know Clay Christensen really well and having a chance to work with Fortune 500 leaders around the, the world 
trying to help their organizations be more innovative, develop growth strategies. Um, and uh, that was a uh, an incredible learning experience for me. A lot of what we do at High Alpha Innovation today is based on uh, what I learned engaging with organizations in my work at, at that firm, Inside. What are some of the key things you learned? Yeah, really good question. Um, so Clayton Christensen, back in, uh, I think it was 1997, released the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, where he explained uh, this problem, which is that executives in large companies can do everything right um, that they're trained to do, serve their best customers, their most profitable customers with ever better products and services. Ultimately, by doing that, it will cause their company, the leader, it will, uh, it will cause their company to go out of business. Because what happens is as the companies move up market to serve these profitable customers, they overserve a large chunk of the market. They leave themselves exposed at the lower end for new entrants, disruptors to come in who grab a foothold and then move up market themselves and displace the incumbents. And it turns out this is a really hard problem to solve. Uh, we've always known this, but almost 30 years later after Clay released that book, um, I think people realize that it's broadly known what the innovator's dilemma is, disruption theory, uh, known by uh, most executive teams in large companies around the world now. That doesn't mean anybody's better at solving it. In fact, ironically, I think organizations are worse at addressing the issue than they were when Clay first exposed the idea and wrote uh, the book. And this is a real problem. Um, these large organizations are getting worse at innovating. Uh, they're getting worse at confronting the opportunities and challenges that face them. And this is a problem for those organizations, of course. It's a problem for society at large because it's through corporations. Um, that we collaborate as large teams and for-profit corporations can do things that startups, governments, other institutions cannot. We need corporations to be effective at innovating. And so what did I learn in that experience? Many lessons and many great conversations with Clay about all sorts of topics and others in the organization, an amazing group of people. But what I learned was that uh, first and foremost, the innovator's dilemma is a much harder problem to solve than uh, I think anybody anticipated when Clay first put that book out. So what was it like to work with Clayton Christensen? Because he's such a legend. People have such admiration for him, such respect. Yeah. I'm sure our listeners would love to learn more. Yeah, an amazing individual. Um, uh, he really was. He uh, amazing for his ideas, but also for the way that he treated those around him. Uh, um, Clay was incredible at uh, uh, helping people around him. Uh, if you were to watch him in a social setting, for example, uh, if you what you would notice is that Clay would go around to every just about every person in the room and try to find a way to engage and see what he could do to help that person with whatever they needed. Uh, and that's remarkable. Uh, I think after Clay's passing, one of the most amazing things to everybody who knew him was how many Hundreds, thousands of stories were told about how Clay helped that person as individually at one point in their lives and from all walks of life. Um, it's really aspirational. Uh, and it's it's amazing how he was able to do that amid all the, the things that he was asked to do. I remember one time I was um I was scheduled to meet with Clay at his office. And I got a call from his assistant that morning asking if we could reschedule the meeting for another time in the morning. I said, of course, happy to reschedule. And went in and found out the reason that he had had to reschedule was because his, his calendar that morning was pretty crazy. Um, that morning, his agenda was meeting with the, uh, the U.S. Senate Majority Leader and then the mayor of New York City and then me. <laughs> so all walks of life and he was willing to spend the time and sit down and um and help and that's remarkable so and then he was he was the other thing that made clay unique was how his brain right his ideas um he was always thinking in terms of theories and and how might what theories might apply to this situation so he he wouldn't he and he would admit he wouldn't always have the the solution or the answers but he was very good at knowing what theory to apply to any problem I remember one of the things he he would say often was that um, if you're having trouble solving a problem, it's probably because you don't have the categories right. The idea that ultimately problem solving is often a, a, a process of categorization, 
of putting things into different buckets and understanding breaking down the problem into the proper categories can help you solve it. If you can name the problem properly, there's a good chance you can solve it. And so quite often when I felt myself getting stuck and still do, um, I will think about, do we, do I have the categories, right? What I mean by that is sometimes uh, I may be thinking about the customer in the wrong way. I may not understand their jobs to be done appropriately, or maybe I've I've categorized the customer into the wrong types of of, of buckets of categories, right? Um, and so by just asking, kind of questioning that, often it will lead to breakthroughs and new ways to think about how to solve issues. Uh, it's a fantastic tool and way to think about strategy and strategic problems. Elliot, this is such an important point that I want us to elaborate on this a little bit. So what would be an example of customer categories? So um, a, a great example, uh, to tell a story that Clay used to tell and is known quite well, uh, the milkshake story, right? So um, there's a, this famous um, the story he would tell often about um, a consultant who was asked to go to a, a fast food restaurant to help them innovate around their milkshake part of their business. And so what this consultant did was went to the restaurant and observed people buying milkshakes and found that there were kind of two big categories during the day of people who'd come in to buy milkshakes. In the morning, people would buy milkshakes who tended to be commuters on their way to work who would buy a milkshake as a substitute for breakfast, something to do in the car to keep them busy. In the afternoon, the buyers of milkshakes tended to be parents of small children who were coming in as a buying a milkshake as a treat for their kids. Same product, very different circumstances, very different problems to be solved or jobs to be done for which they were hiring that milkshake. And the categorization error happens in, in thinking about innovation in terms of the product as it exists rather than the problems that that milkshake solves. And so if you're going to go innovate around milkshake, let's imagine your job is you're working in the restaurant, your job is to think about innovation for the, the milkshake category. You might think about new flavors, or maybe we need another size. Um, maybe we we want to do it in colored cups. You you often our, our tendency is to think about innovation in terms of what we already produce, the product. And what the consultant observed was that you need to think fundamentally about the circumstances and the problems that individuals are trying to solve within those circumstances. So if you want to innovate for that commuter. You might think about milkshakes that uh, have more nutri nutritional content or keep you fuller for longer since it's a substitute for a meal or that are more interesting to consume while you're in the car. Maybe they've got chunks of fruit in them, for example. If you want to innovate for the afternoon milkshake buyer, maybe you're you're doing smaller, uh, you're, you're providing milkshakes in, in, um, with uh, straws that are easier to suck the milkshake through because kids need to consume those milkshakes quickly. So the parents can move on. Um, but if we're not thinking about the fundamental problems we're trying to solve or the reasons for which we're hiring those products, innovations really hard and we get stuck. Once you understand the jobs to be done, you've categorized the problem appropriately, all sorts of new competitive threats uh, come to light and new opportunities come to light too, right? For that commuter in the morning, now we understand the milkshake is competing with the, the coffee place down the street and with the bagel or with the granola bar they might take from their home um, rather than competing purely with other milkshakes. This is very helpful. So other than customers being placed into categories, what else can be placed into categories? Maybe you could give us some other examples. Anything. Think about any problem you're trying to solve. Um, it, it, I know many of your, your listeners may be uh, former or current strategy consultants or people tasked with um, executing strategy inside a large company. Strategy fundamentally is a, a task of storytelling and categorization. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the problem solving piece is that uh, is the categorization problem. It's figuring how to organize information into the appropriate categories and then being able to tell a compelling story about it that persuades other people to do something different. But any any problem you might you might face um, is a categorization issue. Uh, it, it's, it's things as simple as what am I going to wear today <laughs> to as complex as um, uh, where do I want to live um, to um, uh, anything, right? It, it take the, the problem of where do I want to live, right? If, if you don't have the categories, right, you might make the decision optimized for the, the wrong performance dimensions. Um, uh, we, uh, you, you might decide to go move somewhere based on, um, well, it's got low property taxes. <laughs> or or some other element 
And if you don't have the categories right, it turns out that's that's not the uh, the criteria the criterion upon which you wanna you wanna base your decision. Uh, you wanna be comparing your options along other performance dimensions. So understanding the problem that that way can help you make better decisions and unlock opportunities that otherwise remain hidden. This is very helpful. Thank you. Let's talk about Clayton's approach to running his consulting firm. Did you notice anything different from how other people run consulting firms? On average, um, so Clay was not actively involved in the day to day. Um, uh, one of the things that was fun about uh, working with him there is that he'd come in quite often uh, and just share ideas that he was thinking about to help spur thought, and uh, which was amazing. The chance to sit down and just hear him talk about here's what's been on my mind lately, <laughs> coming up with these stories and new ideas and new theories and ways to apply theories it was remarkable. So. If there's anything that was different is that we were we were kind of swimming in uh, in these theories and and thinking about that and everything that we did uh, how to apply those theories very theory based evidence based approach to strategy and innovation super helpful um, but in terms of the organization itself uh, one of the, the the great lessons is that uh, just like every organization the innovators dilemma applies and so we often had to think about how is that applying in our own firm in terms of the incentives and the governance and what were people optimized to do? And was that right? Um, what was our own version of the innovator's dilemma? What experiments could we be running to avoid disruption in our own business? We faced the same challenge as everyone else did. Maybe more awareness because we were so steeped in it, but uh, didn't make it any easier to solve. Elliot, and how did you get to speed on all theories you needed to know? Um, well, through application, I think is the best way to do it. Uh, I uh, and you, you find out that there are a few things that you need to know that apply in a lot of circumstances and can be used over and over again, right? Uh, disruptive innovation, the theory of disruption, is a really powerful idea that once you see it, you can't unsee it, and you see it everywhere. The idea that organizations, as they optimize for efficiency and predictability, become less capable of innovating uh, in meaningful ways, um, you see it all over the place. And you can't help but think about it. Jobs to be done theory that I was talking about. I've, I've never seen a theory uh, or an idea um, change organizations more uh, effectively than that single idea when appropriately applied, um, as simple as it sounds. So there are a few simple theories like that, that um, once you understand them, you can't help but see them everywhere and find opportunities to, to apply the lessons. And if you look back at your time working with Clayton Christensen, what do you feel changed in how you approached life and business? Oh, that's such a good question. Well, uh, just from a personal standpoint, uh, how many people uh, he was able to touch and inspire was remarkable. And as I mentioned, uh, totally aspirational. We should all aspire to be so impactful at a at a one to one level with individuals. Um, and watching him do that was a, a great lesson to me. Uh, the way that he treated anybody from any walk of life um, as as the most important person in the room was um, something that I, I aspire to do. Not long ways from the way he was able to do that, uh, but uh, certainly aspirational. I think, and then just the, the lessons learned from engaging with our, all these large companies around the world who had really meaningful, hard problems to solve. Uh, and seeing how challenging, especially the the the, the topic of innovation was, um, I, I so many good conversations uh, with folks at at the firm, with Clay, with the, some of the clients we worked with there about the challenge of disruptive innovation and how do you really solve it in these large organizations. Um, I saw it firsthand. I'd seen it in my own career, but I, I got a much deeper understanding for the issues. And for uh, what it means to the, you know, the, the C-suite executives in these large companies who are tasked with growing these organizations, how difficult that is. You have a, an $80 billion a year company that you're running and the market is expecting you to generate $8 billion in new incremental revenue next year. That is a, uh, that is a remarkable problem that very few individuals in the history of the world have had to contemplate and deal with. And uh, it's uh, it's very, very challenging. What happens and what we see and what I learned and now can't unsee is that these organizations, as they scale, they become so focused on preserving what exists, of making it more and more predictable and safe, uh, that it gets very hard 
to do the things that are required to learn in an organization. An organization, organizations are uh, skilled corporations are not designed to learn; they're designed to execute, to execute at scale, and they do it very, very well. When you're inside a large organization and all the decisions are made by committees, it feels like things move very slowly. It's by design. That's an organization that is optimized for safety and predictability. Right? If you remember um, uh, years and years ago, uh, GE had a, a CEO named Jack Welch, who was an amazing leader, uh, an amazing management thinker, did incredible things. And I, I changed the course of how people think about running companies, um, which is amazing. But one of the things he said at the time, he said, variation is evil. What he meant by that was we need to root out any variation inside of companies. We need to make everything as predictable as possible. And the reality is that um, people don't work in systems where there's no variation. People are messy. People are chaotic. And the reality is that if there's no variance in a system, there's no life. That sterility is death. Right. And so what he was advocating for effectively was an organization that's on the way to death. Uh, it's not learning anymore. If there's no variance, there's no mistake making, there's no lessons learned, there's no learning. We're doing everything to uh, propagate what we already know and to um, support what we, we think the world, what we think is true. We leave ourselves unexposed to new surprises and anomalies. Clayton Christensen famously had a sign outside his office at the Harvard Business School that he had made himself on a piece of wood that said, anomalies wanted. And he took this very seriously. He, he, was, he would be thrilled when someone would come in with a challenge to one of his ideas or theories because it was a way to test it and to see if uh, maybe he had been wrong and maybe there's a way to make the theory stronger and better and more applicable. Organizations are not designed to seek out anomalies. They're designed to do just the opposite. And so as a result, they're not engaged in the type of activity that is capital inefficient, that creates mistakes, and that creates learning. And so most large companies, as a result, uh, in that effort to root out variation entirely, are actually dying. Uh, many of the executives don't know it, but they're, they're corporate hospice workers. They're managing the company on its way to its, uh, its eventual demise. Remember years ago, uh, Jeff Bezos told his told the world famously this this got uh, there were news headlines about this because he he said Amazon's going to go out of business one day and uh like how could the CEO his CEO at the time how could the CEO say this about his company it's an obvious truth all companies are going to go out of business one day what Jeff Bezos explained to his employees was their job was to uh, put off the death of Amazon for as long as possible by finding new and better ways to serve customers so that's the uh, the trick. That's the hard thing about managing big companies is you simultaneously, you have to improve your operations. You have to operate efficiently. You've got to make money. Uh, but at the same time, you have to do things that are capital inefficient that uh, enable the organization to learn. You've got to put the organization under some stress so that it can unlock, discover anomalies that lead to the insights that help the company find new pathways to growth. And organizations aren't set up to do that. You recently wrote a book, The Illusion of Innovation. What made you write it? And what is the main message you want people to get out of it? Great. Yeah. So why did I, I first, why did I write the book? Uh, the, the Illusion of Innovation, it refers to this idea that organizations, so many organizations spend a lot of time and money on activities that feel like innovation, but that produce no real result. In fact, if anything, uh, destroy shareholder value. Uh, because they uh, they waste money and they render the companies less capable of doing meaningful innovation. That's the illusion. It's this idea that all the stuff we're doing, all the money and time we're spending on innovation is going to lead to something, um, and usually it does not. And this is tricky. Um, I am frustrated by that problem uh, because it's a hard one to solve. If you look at our large organizations, our large institutions, whether they're corporations, schools, governments, they somehow seem less capable than they were 100 years ago. We hear stories from decades or 100 years ago about uh, wow, the Empire State Building was built in uh, you know, 39 months or whatever the number was, re really quickly. Um, we can't imagine things happening at that type of speed anymore. And um, we see examples of organizations failing in the face of opportunity or crisis in a way that seemed um, unlikely decades ago. And so, 
you question, well, why is that? Why are our institutions less capable than they once were of delivering breakthrough change? Because this is a problem. We need them to be capable. And so that's what inspired me to write the book. I wanted to understand why are organizations less capable than they once were and what do we do about it? What are some of the things that you identified that make organizations less capable than they used to? It's uh, The irony is that organizations are better run than they've ever been before, right? Uh, we are, we've are we learned so much over the last 100 years, 200 years about how to manage teams, how to develop strategy, how to run a business in a capital efficient way. So companies are better run than they've ever been before, but at the same time, less capable of dealing with challenge or opportunity than they've ever been. And the reason is that these corporations in particular are optimized for the wrong thing. They're, they're better managed, but they're optimized for safety and predictability. Uh, and we're very good. We've gotten much better at that. Whereas there may have been more variation, more variance in the, the performance of these organizations decades ago. It was that variance that led to learning. And we've gotten very good, in the words of Jack Welch, at, at rooting that out of the system. And as a result, organizations are less capable. We see this in the lifespans of companies. Uh, the lifespans of Fortune 500 companies are shrinking dramatically. Now, you go back 60 years, the average duration of a company on the S&P 500 was 40 plus years. And now it's half of that, um, which tells me that uh, these, these large corporations are less capable of competing in a dynamic marketplace. They're less capable of innovating than they once were and staying ahead of the market. And um, we should want corporations to be successful at innovating. There are certain things that only corporations can do well, right? We're, we're talking to each other on laptops. Uh, a startup couldn't build these laptops. I love startups. I'm an entrepreneur. We build, I build startups for a living. Um, there are certain things startups do well, and that's learning. Startups are very capital inefficient by design, and they're able to learn quickly as a result. And then there are things corporations do well, which is scaled execution. Uh, corporations are very capital efficient. And, um, my view is that that both can benefit from each other. Corporations need to uh, to do a better job of engaging with startups in order to learn. And um, startups, if they engage more effectively with corporations, can be more resilient, and durable, and uh, and grow more quickly as well. And then, how would you define innovation? Because I think it will be helpful for our listeners to have that. Good question. Yeah, when I, when I talk about innovation, I, I'm mostly referring to business model innovation. So. Um, a, a former colleague of mine, Scott Anthony, defined innovation as something new that creates impact. I think that's a pretty good, simple definition. Uh, it's a good working definition anyway. Um, but it's important to then understand the different types of innovation that exist, right? So you, you've got innovation that is intended to improve the efficiency of an organization, where we, we, um, we innovate to, to make our manufacturing line run faster. Uh, that's great. Um, you might have uh, innovation that leads to uh, the replacement of existing products where you, you've got uh, Toyota was selling one model of a car and now they've innovated and the, the next year model replaces the old one. That's a form of innovation too. That's really important. Most of the innovation we benefit from our lives is what might be called, uh, might fit in those categories and be called sustaining innovation. It's kind of incremental improvements over what existed before, but that doesn't create long-term growth in companies. Uh, that helps us manage the decline, in fact. Um, companies to pursue growth over decades and to be resilient in the face of change need to be able to systematically access uh, uh, another type of innovation, which Clayton Christensen called empowering innovation or market-creating innovation. This is innovation that um, opens up new markets, creates whole new categories of products that oftentimes empowers individuals to do things that they, they previously couldn't do. Um, that type of innovation is really hard. And it turns out that startups are actually well positioned to pursue that type of innovation because they, they don't, they're not focused on efficiency. They have nothing to preserve. Corporations are threatened by that type of innovation. And so um, the irony is that they need it. Uh, and you've got to create new ways to access it. If you think about a, a large company, as it scales, it develops uh, systems of governance, incentive, uh, talent, and processes that are optimized for scaled execution of that large business. They're optimized for capital efficiency. Um, we, as we talked about, doing that market creation, empowering type of innovation is, is by nature an inefficient process. You go out in search of anomalies, of things that challenge the status quo. And to do that, you've got to be out there making mistakes and learning. 
that type of innovation requires a completely different form of, of governance and incentives and talent and processes. And the, the problem that most large organizations run into is they try to use the systems they use to run the, the scale organization to do this fundamentally different activity and then are disappointed when it doesn't work. That's the illusion of innovation, right? We can, we can take the, the decision-making processes we use in the incentive systems that we use to run our big business and we can go do these new things because we're smart, we're capable, we, we want to do this. The reality is going out and doing those new things, the empowering innovation uh, almost always fails in those settings, not because people aren't, are, aren't smart, they're very capable. It's a structural problem around governance incentives, um, processes, and sometimes the type of talent. And so it needs a, a structural solution. Uh, the short answer is that organizations at all stages need to engage typically in more experimentation. Uh, we, we tell companies, um, faster, cheaper, weirder experiments designed to uncover the anomalies that will lead you into new paths, not to confirm the things that you already know. Can you elaborate on the weirder path? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that. It's uh, We're trying to design experiments that challenge what the organization believes. Um, uh, examples of this might be looking at a, 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 a the way that our business model runs or who our customer is, right? Or who we've always believed our customer to be. Let's go run an experiment to challenge that and to see if we can learn about new new customers um, or new ways of delivering services to those customers that tell us that the old way doesn't work or is broken. Uh, we define experiments inside of companies as uh, something, some action the organization takes where the outcome isn't known ahead of time. Um, now, the trick is to make sure that experiment is run with a clear hypothesis and design process and, and steps where you can actually learn and then apply that back to the organization. So more experiments, weirder, meaning um, they uncover anomalies. I can give you a good, a good example if you want of how this works in uh, in nature. This is uh, something I talk about in the book. Uh, years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Amazon jungle, which I highly recommend. It's an amazing place. And I went with my son, who is now in grad school, working to become an entomologist. And we went to the Amazon with a very specific goal in mind, and that was to find insects, which for many people sounds like a nightmare. Uh, but we went into the jungle and we'd set up insect traps at night. And the way you do that is we'd, we'd put a white sheet in between two trees and then we'd shine a bright light on that sheet. And within minutes, the sheet would be covered with insects, all kinds of colors and appendages and amazing varieties. The Amazon jungle is incredibly resilient uh, because of all the variation and the, uh, the, the way that it innovates. Uh, the Amazon jungle is very good at innovation, if you think about it. Now, how does it innovate? Well, it innovates through mutation, through evolution, but that evolution happens through mutation at the level of individual cells or organisms. And when those mutations fail, the ecosystem is fine. But when those mutations succeed, the ecosystem is poised to adopt them and to propagate them. But in every way, uh, how the, the Amazon jungle innovates, it's entirely different from the way we do it inside of companies, if you think about this. In the Amazon, there's no hierarchy. There's no top-down objectives related to innovation. There's no grand goal that says, here's what we're trying to achieve. Rather, it's a, it's a random walk where organizations are going about their, their lives or organisms are going about their lives and, and trying to discover through evolution, through mutation, the next available step from where they exist today. Uh, in the Amazon, there's no communication about the innovation that's happening. There's no centralized resource that everybody's reporting to. There's no sense that we need to share the innovation, the mutations across other organisms. In a company, we do just the opposite. Um, we make the mistake often of thinking that transformative innovation needs to be broadly shared and that everybody needs to buy in. Uh, that is a, a falsehood. Um, but if it's sustaining innovation, that's true. If it's an execution challenge, the organization needs to rally behind it, go execute, make sure everybody knows about it. If it's transformative innovation, um, you should not want to, to, uh, to communicate that broadly because you're just opening up opportunities for that innovation to be killed by the organization, which is designed to do in a spirit of, of being safe. The Amazon jungle, so that, that innovation also happens at the level of organisms and cells at the margins, right? Now think about how we do this inside of our companies. We centralize innovation. We uh, we put it into a, a, a centralized innovation team or the level of the CEO, and it is uh, very expensive as a result, whether it fails or succeeds. 
uh, inside the Amazon, in the Amazon jungle, that innovation's at the, at the on the out, outskirts of the or, of the of the ecosystem, and as a result, failure is very cheap. Um, and so, I think there's a lot of lessons to learn. Uh, we want our organizations to be more resilient, and so if we could somehow make innovation inside these organizations less top down, constrained by a, a defined amount of resources, of course, but less objectives driven, if it were uh, far less often communicated broadly, fewer people who can say no to new things is a good thing when you're talking about transformative innovation. And if it were done more at the margins, at the, the equivalent of individual organisms or cells rather than centralized inside of large organizations, I think um, our large corporations would be better off and more effective at dealing with the, the challenges and opportunities they confront. Elliot, to wrap up this great conversation, what would you like our listeners to do differently on Monday morning at 8 a.m. or tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., but whatever it will be for them? And then also, where can they learn more about you, buy your book, anything you want to share? Great question. Um, and thank you for this opportunity again. I think uh, Monday morning, the thing to do, uh, both in our personal lives and in, in companies, is to go seek anomalies. Go run more experiments in your life to challenge what you think you already know uh, and find the equivalent uh, inside your organization. Uh, you'll be better off and more resilient as a result. More experiments, faster, cheaper, weirder. Avoid the illusion of innovation that so many organizations and individuals pursue. Uh, and where can people find me? Uh, best is probably on uh, Twitter. ER Parker is where I am. Um, the illusion of innovation, uh, you can find that uh, at um, any, any place where you typically buy books uh, should be there for you. Thank you, Elliot. Such a pleasure to have you with us today. Incredible conversation. Thank you very much. And for everyone tuning in, thank you for being with us today. Our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, you can get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It is a free download. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. It is F-I-R-M-S consulting.com forward slash overall approach. And if you're currently updating your resume, you can get McKinsey and BCG winning resume, which is a resume that got offers from both firms. You can get it at firmsconsulting.com forward slash resume PDF. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Elliot. And I'm looking forward to connect with you all next time.